Welcome to Issues in Japan. This time, I would like tentatively to share the research achievements of a leading Japanese think tank on the main issues and recommendations in the U.S. China relationship. Despite variables such as the situation in Ukraine, the U.S. China confrontation is expected to be a major axis of global politics for decades to come. Therefore, Japan should clarify its principled argument regarding its position on this issue in light of its national interests. This should be divided into short term and medium to long term, and should be formulated in light of the diverse aspects of the U.S. China confrontation in each region and issue area. We should determine where areas of U.S. China confrontation particularly stand out, broaden Japan's options there. And then create an environment in which Japan is not at a disadvantage. To this end, it is important not only to know China and its allies, but also to analyze and understand Japan's current situation in a dispassionate and objective manner. Japan is China's neighbor and has close economic ties with China. The rising capabilities of China's naval police over the Senkaku Islands issue. And China's technological innovations in the digital domain and elsewhere, China has been preparing for the unification of Taiwan. Japan should consider and address these points based on objective facts and realism, not assumptions and hopes. The first part is the implications through the study. China's science and technology is already developing into a formidable force. And the country is likely to adopt policies to further strengthen it in the future, including through the construction of digital infrastructure. In addition, the struggle for supremacy between the U.S. and China over science and technology is expected to continue for a fairly long time. Japan needs to reinvent itself as a science and technology nation in order to gain a firm position in the complex international situation. In China, the government has been extremely siphoning off the fruits of growth, and has also been promoting the concentration of power in the hands of President Xi Jinping through rule of law construction and other measures. The merits of this approach can be seen in the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and the massive inputs into the promotion of science and technology. At the same time, however. It has also created sins, such as the disparity between the rich and the poor, the decline in the vitality of the private sector, and the creation of a government bureaucracy inclined to inaction. It is necessary to look at the future rise and fall of China's economy in line with the actual situation. The nature of the U.S.-China conflict differs from region to region and case to case around the world. In some regions, the U.S.-China confrontation is difficult to see, and in some cases, the U.S. and China are cooperating with each other, rather than perceiving and discussing everything based on the U.S.-China confrontation. We need to make diverse and flexible observations and considerations for each region and issue area. For this reason, Japan should not have a simple and rigid policy. But rather should have strong, strong, but with a certain flexibility principles regarding the U.S.-China confrontation, so that it can flexibly deal with diverse situations. Although it is said that there is an anti-China consensus in the United States, a unanimous strategy toward China has not been formed. The majority of Republican supporters see the Chinese regime as a problem in addition to China's actions, and have adopted a hardline stance toward China. In contrast, Democratic Party supporters are divided in their stance toward China between those on the left, who essentially believe that diplomatic engagement should be persistent regardless of the political system, and those in the middle. Who believe that the country should compete with those who cannot abide by agreements and rules? These differences have given rise to approaches to China, such as the strongly Republican regime collapse theory, which holds that we should wait for China to weaken and transform its system of governance, and the strongly Democratic competitive coexistence theory, 
which holds that we should aim to moderate China's external behavior through coalition building while avoiding conflict with China, which actually prevents the three forces from forming a strategy toward China with which they can agree. Although the Biden administration has put forth a democracy versus authoritarianism policy, in actual diplomacy it is likely to cooperate with non-democratic states in areas where cooperation is possible. While policy elites in Washington have not entirely rejected the significance of the democracy summit, they are not strong supporters of the approach of identifying partners by political system and are more likely to argue that functional cooperation should be promoted with non-democracies as well. Nevertheless, the Biden administration has adopted the slogan, Democracy and Human Rights. The reason for this is that in the field of foreign affairs, it is able to respond to demands from the left wing of the Democratic Party to achieve social justice, for example, by guaranteeing human rights and fighting corruption, and denounce centrists as well, without incurring criticism from the Republican Party. Membership in the CPTPP remains a high political hurdle for the Biden administration, which has put forward the alternative, Indo-Pacific economic framework, but its impact is unknown. With China and Taiwan having applied to join the CPTPP, some policy elites in Washington are of the opinion that the U.S. should also join. And some democratic centrists are of the opinion that trade liberalization should proceed. However, the democratic left remains negative about trade liberalization with partners that do not meet labor and environmental standards, and in the Republican Party, Trump supporters are negative about joining the CPTPP. Under these circumstances, Biden's proposal to liberalize trade by joining the CPTPP would mean incurring political criticism for putting corporate interests ahead of workers' interests and, moreover, running a significant risk of losing the support of the white working class in the process, so it appears to have been ruled out as a policy option. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is an alternative bundle's existing economic engagement measures. However, there has yet to be a convincing explanation that its economic impact is greater than that of the CPTPP. The U.S.-China competition in cyberspace is multi-layered, including information technology, communications infrastructure, and content, cognitive domain. In terms of information infrastructure, China is expanding its cross-border optical cable network through the Digital Silk Road, forming a regional advantage that extends into the Eurasian continent, which may change the flow of information on a global scale. The second part is the policy recommendations, focusing on the measures to China. 1. Establish a vision for a strategy toward China based on comprehensive national interests and communicate it domestically and internationally. Based on the premise of constant tension not only around the Senkaku Islands but also around our country. A precise balanced diplomacy is required to maintain stable civilian exchanges and economic cooperation while working with the U.S. and other allies. However, Different actors in the country currently have different perceptions of China. While addressing short-term issues, it is necessary to formulate a strategy toward China based on the national interest from a medium to long-term and comprehensive perspective, and to reflect this in the newly formulated national security strategy and other measures to formulate a certain level of social consensus. 2. Develop a new Japan-China cooperation framework starting from the 50th anniversary of the normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and China. To promote development in Asia, Japan and China, as regional powers, can consider various forms of cooperation, including economic, environmental, and human resource development. In addition to common challenges such as an aging society and environmental issues, Japan and China should continue to cooperate on an equal footing and maintain contact with Chinese society in light of the framework for third-country market cooperation agreed to in 2018.
Three. The fact that both China and Taiwan have applied to join the CPTPP is an opportunity for Japan. It will provide a valuable diplomatic forum for dialogue on China's economic system and other domestic policy issues, and will also help to maintain a balance in Japan-China relations, which are expected to continue to face challenges in the future. China should not be allowed to join the CPTPP easily, and although negotiations will take a long time, Japan should be open to discussions with China while keeping Taiwan's membership in mind. Finally, on Japan's security, one, strengthen deterrence around the Senkaku Islands and in the East China Sea. In order to avoid military friction, it is essential to cooperate with the U.S. And other allies improve our deterrence capability and promote security dialogue with China in parallel. In addition to new domain defenses such as cyber, space, and electromagnetic waves, Japan must be prepared for influence operations, guided operations, two measures for China's digital infrastructure construction and digital Silk Road. China is increasing its influence over emerging countries and authoritarian countries through the export of telecommunications infrastructure, along with strengthening cooperation with democratic nations. Japan should seek to strengthen relations with regional powers, including those inside the Eurasian continent and other geopolitically important countries and regions. And build cooperative relationships in the formation of global international norms and the formulation of international standards. With such countries, it is necessary to coordinate non-alert approaches, such as expert meetings on cybersecurity and capacity-building support for government officials. Three, China's preparations for the war on intelligence. The Chinese People's Liberation Army (PLA) is accelerating its preparations for the war on intelligence, which involves the military use of artificial intelligence (AI) and unmanned vehicles. The number of Chinese unmanned patrol aircraft flying in the East China Sea is increasing, and new developments such as the normalization, autonomy. Heavy equipment and swarming of unmanned aircraft flights are possible in the future. In Japan, it is necessary to deepen the policy discussion on how to deal with China's war on intelligence and link it to concrete measures, as well as to focus on domestic economic and technological promotion to increase competitiveness in strategic emerging technological fields. That's all for now. Thank you for your interest.